um, that each one of you can experience. So, uh, Justin, I, uh, um, I'll hand it over to you in the interest of time, you know, take it over. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, Ravish. Yeah, I hope everyone here is doing well today. So I'll be running through a demo. So just let me know once you can see my screen. All right. Okay. So I think everyone can see my screen now. Okay. So I'll get started. Over here, what you're seeing here, it's called the Joget App Center. So what you're seeing here on the right side, you can think of this as a home screen for your smartphone. So whenever you click on any of these icons, it brings you to specific apps. So in Joget, it's all about creating apps without writing any code or minimizing the amount of code that you need to write in order to, to uh, deliver full-fledged enterprise applications. So I'll get started quickly and I'll just, uh, I'm already logged in as the admin up here. So I'm going to just click on design new app and I'll give this a meaningful name. So we won't make any complex apps today. Uh, this demo here is just a really simple wallet app just to uh, give you guys the idea. So I'll call this, for example, the Cardano uh, sample. Okay. So I'll give this a meaningful name and click save. Now, by doing this, we have a blank app canvas over here. So just to bring you through quickly, a Joget app, it consists of four major components. So we have a form. So the form is where we can input data, we can view that data back. The data list is where we can tabulate all the data that we have stored uh, from, from user inputs to the form. We have processes over here to orchestrate uh, business workflows or implement business rules within. And finally, the user view to to expose all the elements that we created to the front end and bring all those features forward. Now we'll get started, a simple wallet, right? So we let store simple details about a wallet. So I'll click on create new form. So for this form ID here, I'll keep it simple. So I'll call it account details, referring for account form name, account details, and the table name, I'll just give it a meaningful name for now. So I'll just call this Cardano sample. SP account, yep, click save, right. So by doing this, it brings us to the form builder. So what you're seeing here is the form builder. And on the left side here is all the form elements that's available to us. And in the middle here is the form canvas. So in Joget, everything is pretty much drag and drop and configure. So for example, a simple wallet, um, all we need is the, the account address, the mnemonic phrase, and maybe a few more fields. So first of all, I'll edit this section here. I'll give it a meaningful name. So account data, click OK. And I'll just drag in a few fields to represent, uh, for example, let's say this would be the account address. So I'll just name this accordingly, account address. And I'll just drag in a few more. So this is where I'll store the mnemonic phrase for, for anybody to operate the account. Okay. Click OK. Now, uh, we'll just drag in a few more fields to indicate if this is a test account or not. So this test account. And finally, to indicate who's the owner of this account. So when I say account owner, uh, what I meant by this is actual Joget users that can log into the system and start using their wallets. So for example, I'll call this account owner. Account owner. And okay, the form looks good enough. It's basic enough. So we'll click on save, okay? Now in Joget, I, I can either create the data list or the user view manually, but a quicker way to do this is by using something called the app generator. So on top here, we just click on app generator and there are various elements here that we can generate based on a generic template to help speed up development. So for example, here, I'll just check gener uh, generate CRUD. And for anybody here that doesn't know, CRUD basically stands for create, retrieve, update, delete, the primary functions of, of, of handling information. So I'll click on generate and there we go. I'll close it out and I'll close this form. So you notice I'm coming back here to the app design and I have a form and I have the data list generated for me. I have the user view, a front end view also generated. 
So if I just want to take a quick look to see how it looks like from the front users, front end users perspective, I'll click on launch. And what you see here is basically what the end user is already seeing. So we can click here. This is the CRUD that was just generated. Now at this point, we're ready to start generating accounts. So I'll come back here and I'll just make a really simple process to run the tool. So I'll click on design processes and uh, just wait a moment. Okay, so what we're looking here, it's called the process builder. So process builders is where we can start to define user screens. We can define business rules or system tools to automate and so on. So for this process right here, I'll give it a really simple name. So for example, um, generate account. Okay. Generate account. Okay. Right. So to run the tool to generate the wallet, I'll just drag in a tool. I'll just need to connect the dots here. So, and, end, And that's pretty much all we need. And I'll name this tool so that's clear. So I'll say generate Cardano account. Give it a meaningful name. Click OK. And just like that, it's good to go. So I'll click on deploy. And just wait a few seconds. All right. And just like that, the deployment is successful. And I can close up the process builder and refresh the page. So what I did just now is uh, plotting out the process that I'm expecting or, or for the end users to follow through. And in this case, it's just a really simple, um, a really simple tool here. Nothing, no user inputs at all. So at this point, we're ready to start mapping the tool. I'll just click on configure mapping. Okay. And over here, all we need to do is click on this tool here and find the tool in order to generate the account. So in this case, it's called the Cardano Generate Account Tool. So I'll click on it. Now, at this point here, there's no coding at all. All we need to do is just click a few fields and be ready to start using it. So of course, we're going to run on the testnet. Um, we're going to store that account data to the form that we just created, so account details. And at this point, it's just all about finding the fields that we have and mapping them accordingly. So for example, mnemonic phrase, account owner, and is this account or not? And for the account owner, I'm just going to uh, leave this blank for now. Okay, we'll come back here very quickly. And so I'll just click Submit. I'll save the plugin configuration. And there's just one last thing we need to do. We need to define who are we generating this account to. So I'll just click on this run process here. And I'll just create one more simple form here. So I'll just click create new form and just say um, bind account. So bind account. So this Cardano table name, I'll just define the person. So ACC, click save. Okay. And there we go. So coming back here, I just need a really simple select box in here to tell the plugin, who am I mapping it to? So I'll click edit. I'll say um, user. Okay, let's keep it simple. User. And now I can just use something called a options binder to help me retrieve the necessary information that I need. In this case, it's the Joget users that I currently have in my system. So I'll select the user options binder and just leave all these settings default pretty much. They're good enough and click OK. Right, so now we want to try out this form quickly to see how it works. We can just click on Preview. And OK, we managed to retrieve all the our target users. And uh, let's just give this a, a something, uh, a non-generic section title here. So I'll say, select a user to find an account to. Click OK, and click Save. OK. so. Right now, uh, since we already have uh, this, this starter form here, uh, I just need to uh, remember the table name and come back to the configuration over here and map it to the account owner. So in this case, I'm using uh, a Joget specific feature here called the form hash variable to dynamically retrieve values for me. So in this case, I'll say whoever selected the user will be the account owner and click submit. Right, 
So now that we've gone through all of this, it's just one last step to expose this process that we just created here. So all we need to do is come back and edit the user view. Right, so we've seen the form builder, we've seen the process builder, and here is the user view builder. And once again, it's a very familiar experience. All we need to do is drag and drop the element into our canvas and just configure it accordingly. So we can just select and bind it to the process they've created. And we'll call this um, generate account. Right. And click OK and click Save. Now, OK, we're finally ready to start generating Cardano accounts. So we'll come back to runtime here from the end user's perspective and refresh the page. Right. So you notice over here, we have our run process menu to, to, to trigger the, the generate account process. We'll click on it. And at this point, this is the form that we just created. So let's say we are binding it to myself, the admin user. And when I click submit, it's going to run that process and it's telling us that it's already successful. So when I come back to my CRUD here, okay, we can see that uh, an account has indeed been successfully generated just like that. Now, one thing you might notice is mm, this data list here, this listing here doesn't look quite of quite like what we want. So as the Jogan admin, we can just enable click edit. We can see the data list that is responsible for this and immediately click on it to navigate to that data list to start making changes. So uh, you can think of this as a iterated development. Uh, what you do is exactly what you get. So for example, we don't need the mnemonic phrase exposed on the front. We just drag the account address, move around the columns, and if we need to, we can even drag in on the top here to act as a data list filter and click on save. Now, once I do this, the changes are applied immediately. So I can come back to the front end user again, refresh the page, and there we go. So just like that, we have all of these uh, columns arranged exactly the way we want. So we have done with the first portion of the demo. Now I'm going to move on to the second portion about uh, running transactions. Uh, make it simple, just sending some ADA points over. So with this, we are just going to need another account to act as the receiver. So I'm just going to run this generate account again. Once again, I'll bind it back to myself, hit submit, and we should have uh, two addresses here for us. Uh, right now, let's just remove these as we don't need it. Okay, right. So while I get started on creating the second part of the demo, I'm just gonna quickly copy this address here and fund it from the, the, the faucet. So I'm just gonna paste it in, do this. Ah, captures, of course. <laughs> So right. just mm -hmm. while Justin is going through that, I just want to add that the reason why we start with a wallet is because pretty much any application that you want to build that is going to access the public blockchain is going to have to deal with the uh, universal term gas fees. So in being able to demonstrate the ease with which you can develop a wallet, generate accounts, and then execute transactions and receive transactions, that's one of the core elements of having to build a blockchain powered uh, application. And everything that Justin is demonstrating right now is actually sending and receiving transactions and data through the Cardano testnet. And the testnet is a replication of an actual live center. So after this, we are able to discuss an actual business application, in our case, the traceability application that Ravi should mention and you will get a fuller sense of the integration of generating the wallet, connecting to the test net, moving into creating a business application, all within this demo. Thanks, Jess. All right, thank you, Andrew. Right, so coming back to the demo, our wallet has already been funded with test data coins. So I'll come back and this time we'll design um, a form to help us perform transactions. So as we know in a transaction, it's pretty rudimentary. It's basically who's the sender, who's the receiver, and what's the amount. So just three fields that we need. So with this, I'll come back to the app design here, and I'll create another form. And this will be to, to, to be storing details about the transaction itself. 
So I'll call this a transaction details. Okay, give this form a meaningful name. And I'll give this another table here to store the account data, the transaction data, sorry. Click save. And once again, we'll be brought back to the form builder. And at this point, uh, it's, the, it's the same thing all, all over again. It's just change the section title. So we'll say this is transaction details. And all we need is the sender, the receiver, and the amount. So I'll drag in the select box for us to select the sender easily. So I'll edit the select box first. I'll call this a sender, okay? Options binder. And this time I'll use something called the default form options binder to help us retrieve all that data that we just collected. In, in this case, it's the account data. So I'll choose account details and I'll just represent it by the, 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 the address. I'll click okay. All right, it works, so it's good enough. And we just need the amount and the receiver. So I'll drag in two more text fields and call this amount. Okay, and finally the receiver itself. So receiver, we can just paste in the address. No problem here. Click OK and click Save. Right, so, okay, we have our transaction form. Now, I, I'm not gonna go through all that process builder again to, to make it all, let's speed things up even more. So once again, I'll use the app generator feature. So other than generating a CRUD, I'm also going to use the app generator to help me generate a approval process based on a default template like this. So an approval process, basically, if the approver approves the transaction, then run that transaction, uh, the transfer transaction. So I have both of these options checked and click generate. So this shouldn't take way too long. Just give it a few moments. All right, so the generation is done. I'll close it and come back to the app design. And just like that, we have our elements generated for us, the data list, the user view, the elements has been automatically added in for us. And when we come to the processes, we also have another process that has been generated automatic, uh, automatically for us. So we'll just wait a few moments. Okay, right. So the process diagram has been generated, as we can see. Now we just need to make one minor modification here. So I'll just click on design process. Now on this part here, email on approve, I'll just change it up for the Cardano uh, later to, to run the transaction. So I'll call this um, send transaction, okay. Send transaction, okay, right. And I'll just add a few more variables in here. So uh, just to keep you up to speed, the workflow variables in here, it stores values that is specific of a, that is specific to a particular process instance. So the value will change depending on the instance that you're running on. So in this case, I want to store additional fields such as the transaction explorer URL for us to see later and the validation status. So I'll call this transaction validated, click okay, and looks good to go and click deploy. So just like that, I'm making quick changes to the process and we're almost ready. So I'll come back here, I'll click okay, refresh the page, and right, come back to our process that we just uh, changed. And this time, we just need to map the, the tool to that plugin that we just have. So once again, I'll go to configure mapping and I will edit this field here called send transaction. And I'll find that tool here. It's called the Cardano send transaction tool. So once again, it's a familiar experience. We click on it and I'll select the test net. The backend service here, uh, there's two options here for now. There's block cross and there's Dandelion, which is a free open source API for everyone to use. So I'll select Dandelion. And now in the transaction details here, this is where we start to perform the mapping. So Andrew or Rish, if you have anything to add on while I configure this form, you can go ahead first while I yeah, sure. configure. So um, I just wanted to add that, you know, what, what um, Justin is demonstrating is uh, ability to create business applications around the chain as well. This is not just, um, you know, writing to the chain and reading from the chain. For example, if there is a approval process or there is a business process ahead of uh, putting the transaction on the chain, that's what this is all about. 
um and i think as soon as we he is done we will also show um you know a finished application what does it look like you know in a very simple terms if we have a, a simple uh, you know coffee traceability app for example coffee bean traceability app you know you you are writing the transactions as uh, the events are happening and and then how uh, uh, um what can be exposed uh, to a end user that they can validate on the chain also that yes these are these are the real transactions that are happening with the credible sources as well so that's something that we will show uh, in a minute but what you are seeing is uh, what uh, um uh justin is configuring what me- metadata we want to write in addition to the transaction for example you know a transfer of x amount of ada to someone else for example but at the same time if i want to capture some metadata that should go on the chain what would that what can that be and it's very easy to how you can map the information that you have captured and you know put that as metadata meta in here and right. ratish would you be able to point out how um our actual accelerating enterprise adoption proposal the objective of it is to simplify some of the processes that Justin is going through right now yes 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 so um uh what what we are trying to do is uh, some of the things that you saw Justin is you know using a drop down and using some keywords like you know for for variables i think someone was asking that question about the variables as well those are the things we will simplify when when we are talking about this project you know from uh, catalyst funding perspective we want to enhance this so you 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 are m- more able to uh, instead of you know hash form dot cardano i mean these all will become drop downs so it can be just retrieved rather than you know um, adding the references like this it will be even much more simpler than what it looks like right now what we have is already eliminating a lot of coding um if you ask me but it will take it to the next level and this is a this is a open source i'll share with you i mean it's on git repository we want to open this plugin to the community so they can also extend the plugin you know going forward not just uh, and 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 release additional functionalities in in as as the new functionality get exposed so justin all right thank you ravish and thanks to andrew right okay so over here uh, coming back to the demo we have already done the necessary configuration i've also enabled transaction metadata data to store some form values into the blockchain metadata the transaction metadata itself and just as a a, a way to read it i am also uh, checking for the transaction validation status and for the plugin to output a explore url for me to see the transaction on the cardano test and explorer so at this point i'm done I'll click submit and we are almost ready to try the app. So we'll come back to our app design over here and we just need to verify that we have those elements that has been generated for us previously. So as you can see, all these elements down here, these are the, 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 the approved process that has been generated for us. So let's try it out on runtime. So I'll come back here, I'll refresh the page and down here, I can click on submit transaction details. And at this point here, all I need is the sender, the amount and the receiver. So give me a moment. I'm just going to copy the receiver address here. So this is the address. I'll copy it and paste it as the receiver down here. And the amount, let's say I'll send uh, 5.15 uh, ADA tokens, right? I'll click submit. And over here, we can see that this is our uh, our, our transaction that we want to perform. Now, since I'm also uh, the approver, I can also see this in my own inbox in here. So I can click on view. And once I see, okay, the sender, the receiver, the amount, it looks correct. I can just click on approve. Now by doing this, it will start to uh, create a, a transaction and uh, sending it to the blockchain. So at this point here, the process is complete. Now. I can inspect it by using the Joget monitor. Uh, since I'm in Joget admin, I can go yep. to completed processes. Justin, I want to highlight, um, mm-hmm. you know, just like what Justin is trying to do is just looking at the transaction. He's going in the in the Joget backend. Some of these things will be exposed as the capabilities for drag and drop to be able to see that on the front end as well. Yep, 
Thank you, Ravish. Okay, so for this, uh, the transaction validation, it, it will take a while, right? So typically transaction validations, it can take from seconds to maybe a few short minutes. Block validations, it's a different thing altogether. So uh, hopefully it should be validated quickly. So, okay, it's not available yet. Right, just need to keep refreshing. Okay, I'll show you this later, but essentially, I've already shown you how you can perform transactions, how you can generate wallets in Joget without writing any code, all in a matter of just a few minutes. So um, now that I'm done with this short demo here, I want to show you guys what can be achieved even with the current uh, plugin pack that we have. Right, so just to show you, here we have the transaction has already been posted to the blockchain. And here's the metadata that has been written uh, uh, by the plugin itself. So, yep, here's the proof, <laughs> right? And, okay, so now I'm going to move on to a, a proof of concept that I've created using with these existing plugins. And I'll let Andrew to fill in as we go. So um, I'm going to log out quickly. Oh. Okay. And I'm going to log in as the processor to start So with. I'll let, uh, while uh, Justin is uh, logging in, I was actually looking up a GitHub link uh, for uh, somebody who had requested the open source. So I will post that to the chat. To the chat. I, I, I uh, just, uh, I'll take care of it. I'll post that out. Okay, thank you, Ravish. So um, basically one of the key functions that uh, we require, particularly in Africa, is uh, the traceability of agri-food, of mining, of diamonds, uh, in order, in the case of diamonds, to be compliant with the Kimberley process. And basically traceability allows for compliance with UN sustainability development goals. But one of the issues is most blockchain traceability systems exist in their own silo and are very, very expensive to implement. It takes an incredibly long time to build in the order of months, three months, six months, and more. And the costs end up ranging in the, from the tens of thousands to the hundreds of thousands. So one of the initial interactions that I had with Jogit and Wada was the challenge of, could we actually build a traceability system that would read and write to and from the Cardano blockchain? I leave Justin with the floor now. All right, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so here it is. Here's the an app, a traceability app based on coffee that has is developed using Joga and Cardano blockchain. So essentially, um, traceability it's writing information to the transaction. So you can think of this as a sort of a decentralized database that's open for anyone to verify. So in this app here, I'm just going to go through the processes of of how your coffee arrived from the farmers and all the way to your cup in the cafe. So yeah, now I'm locked in as the person, David. So David here, he is a processor. So as, a, as in the role of a processor, the responsibility is to collect the coffee cherries from the farmers. So for example, I have a form over here. So let's say as a processor, I can come into my inbox. And right now, of course, I got nothing. <laughs> Uh, happening. So I can click on app batch. So here's where I start to register the batch I'm collecting from the farmers. So in here, we have uh, various form elements that we can uh, implement in Joget forms. So for example, here's the current date and the collector. I'm just going to choose this is the collector for today, for example. And for the received batches, I can start to record down um, how much the farmers are collecting for today. So I'll say perhaps this person, he has collected 15 kilos and I'll add another one. So this person, Mr. Randy here, he collected, let's say 25 kilos of coffee cherries, click submit. And as you can see, there are uh, form automations also going on here. It auto calculates the batch weight. And once we're done recording this, we can click on submit. And what happens is on the back end, it's actually writing these data into the Cardano blockchain. So of course it will take a while, but I'll show you an example of how it would look like. So for example, I can click on edit and we can see there's a link already exposed for us. We can click on it and we can verify the details ourselves. 
So over here, like the batch ID, the collector, uh, the date creator, and so on and so forth, right? So anybody, not just the, the, the staff or the company, e even the public can come back and verify it themselves. So this is just one part. So once we're done uh, adding a batch, then the processor comes back to register to produce. So at this point, we can go to register produce and we can select from the batches that we have. So for example, this is the batch that we just added just now. We can click on add batch and we can start to fill in the details such as the coffee process, the data processing, the tracking number and so on and so forth. And let's say we're done with all of this. And uh, once you, you register it or you send it to the destination company, for example, to a roaster, so that's where the role of the processor ends. And now coming to the role of the roaster. So I'll log out, and this time I'll log in from the role, from the perspective of a roaster. So I'll now, click on login. Yep. Justin, while you're logging in and out, I'm going to ask a, a layman question. Most mm -hmm. of the people will be accessing these screens on a mobile yep. device or a tablet. Mm -hmm. So how much work needs to go in to making our applications mobile ready? Right, so that's a very good question, Andrew, thank you. So uh, the question about mobile, basically any apps that you create in Juge is automatically mobile responsive. So this includes all the elements that's currently inside. So for example, let's see how it looks like from a mobile perspective. So let's say, how does it look like from iPhone 12 Pro? So everything else, it, it conforms to the space that it currently has. So this is how the sidebar looks like right now, for example. Or perhaps from a tablet, for example, this is how it looks like from tablet. So as you can see, it's mobile responsive by default. So from the app designer's perspective, there's no effort needed at all, right? It's just, you, you drop it in and it's mobile responsive out the get-go. Justin, I want to also add that it's not just mobile responsive. Um, it also is enabled for push notification. Um, it's a PWA progressive web app. So if somebody um, you know, gets, a, uh, gets a task to do something, uh, they can get push notification as well in there. Yep, right. Just to add to what Ravish just said, yeah, so even Joget apps by default is PWA compliant. So uh, we're talking push notifications, um, uh, installable from browser. Um, let's see what else. We also got offline background synchronization capabilities and, and some native uh, capabilities that would otherwise be not possible if it's just purely browser alone. So yeah. I believe Mer Mercy, you have a question. Yes, a very quick question. Um, I know that, uh, and probably Justin, you've covered it, but um, let me just ask. <laughs> um, so uh, within the Cardano ecosystem, and in fact, most uh, blockchains, when some of these dApps are, are, are built, there is a big uh, focus on um, uh, auditing to make sure that it's secure. Do we have anything inbuilt here or because it's sort of um, low code, that's covered uh, in a sense? Thanks. Um, that's a very good question. In Joget, we have a full auditability, not just for the data changing, even if somebody's changing the app, app as well. Uh, uh, Justin, can you quickly just uh, mm -hmm. open up that audit trail thing? Yeah, sure. You know, monitor and um, so there is there's a lot of monitoring and security in place. Um, obviously, I mean the uh, we are not talking about identity management and all here. It's it's a topic in itself. But let's quickly see, um, you know, what you are asking for. Um, if you go to, yeah, audit trail. So if you look at it, it will give you every every event that is happening in, you know, from data changes perspective, you can, um, you know, even logging in, logging out a transaction, uh, a change in the form, it has full audit trail capability. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on. All right, <laughs> right. I'm going to move on with the demo. Okay, so just give me a moment to quickly log back in as myself. So I'm going to log back in as Cat as the roaster where we left off. And okay, right. So as we recall previously from the processor, 
we submit a, we register produce and we send it off to the roaster. Now from the roaster, uh, we would see from our own inbox and say, oh, wow, we received a batch from the processor. So at that point, all we need to do is acknowledge that we received it or report it back, send it back if there's an issue. And if you do approve it, once again, a transaction is also written in here. And once we have the received batch, and this is where we, now we can take that produce and start to make our own roast batches. So just to show you, this is how the form would look like. So from here, we can start to select uh, uh, which produce has arrived uh, to our, our factory. So we can select uh, perhaps this batch over here. We can click submit, register it, and we can start to input all this information like the roasting profile, who's the cupper, the coffee profile, and so on and so forth. Now, once you do that, you have created multiple roast batches. At this point, it's ready to ship it off to the cafes. So this is where we can start to send a package. Now, once you do this, um, of course, you need to input like the packaging date, the tracking number, and who do you want to send it off to? So you select a cafe. You can select the roast batch that you had. So for example, roast batch one, and also input the data that's necessary, like the, the package, uh, the weight, the number, and so on. Now, once you do this and send a package off, um, at this point, it's just awaiting for the cafe to receive it. So now, from the perspective of the roaster, we're going to come back out and log in as All the. Right. So, mm -hmm. Justin, while you're logging out and logging back in, we had mm -hmm. a good question from Peter Van Garderen. And he mm -hmm. asked uh, it's a multi point question. Um, he asked, how decentralized is the stack? And for, I'll just carry on actually. Then he asked, does all metadata end up on the chain? Then he asked, does some data live on a central server? What are the trusted nodes? And he calls as an example, perhaps the Dandelion Lion API. What I did respond, and I'd love for you to expand upon in the group, is that we have the choice. And I think you had started along that process uh, when defining the wallet to determine what metadata would show up in the test net, but the test net was taking a bit of time to respond. So at some point we can go back and look at that. But how would you address those questions? How decentralized is the stack? Does all metadata end up on the chain? Does some data live on a central server? And what are the trusted nodes uh, for you and Ravish? Right. Um, I'll, I'll, okay, Ravish, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, let me quickly talk about this. So does uh, all metadata end up on the chain? You, it is our decision. There is, or not all the data has to go to the chain. And even in example that uh, Justin showed, he only picked a few fields that should be written as metadata. Uh, how decentralized is the stack? I'm not clear on the question though. I'm assuming you're asking for, if I am using you know, this platform to build a, a, an app, which has to interact with another company that also has to build, build an app and interact through the chain, absolutely doable. Um, don't see a problem there, but I'm not clear on the question. So excuse me on that. Does some data live on the central server? You can choose uh, uh, what will live on where this Joget instance is running. All the data related to this app will be there, but you can choose what it, data should flow through uh, through the chain. So that's that's the decision uh, point for for the organization. Uh, and uh, what are the trusted nodes? Uh, this is you know we are uh, the um, our uh, platform has two integrations, one with BlockFrost to uh, use the Cardano APIs, and second one is Dendelion. So, um, you know, as the new sources get added in, this is where the plugin will grow. You know, we can integrate with any number of these um, intermediaries, API integration pieces available to us. I am assuming at some point in time, a, you know, a JDK for Cardano is going to be released as well, or uh, SDK is going to be released as well. We can integrate that in, in here as well. So there are all these options for integrations. What we are demonstrating is there are two options that we have baked in right now in this beta uh, version. 
Uh, did it answer um, your question? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, mostly. I, I think, um, I think as this is of concern, of, and this is difficult for anybody creating blockchain solutions, as you know, is that, I mean, the advantage of blockchain is that we, we have distributed consensus and we no longer have centralized data stores. Um, but if you have a SQL database and you have an API that's doing the indexing for you, now you're trusting those sources and that's a point of potential attack or uh, attack surface for bad actors. So it, especially for a traceability app, like you demonstrated, if you are one of the partners in that traceability chain or you're an auditor or you're an end user that wants to audit it, um, if, you, if you're just looking at a web interface that's pulling data from a database, then you say, well, then you no longer have the advantage of trusting the distributed consensus from the blockchain. So um, I'm not saying I have easy answers to that problem. I'm just curious to see how you guys are tackling that. And um, I, my understanding is that Dandelion APIs, you, I, you could, it's open source software as well. So anybody could, in theory, create their own Dandelion uh, API node and query that. Um, and the, yeah, the reason I was asking how much metadata is on chain, because if, if the, I don't have to, I, could, I can use your app, I can use apps like this as a convenient point to see the information. But if I was really, uh, if I had doubts, I could always go and consult a blockchain explorer and see the metadata directly on chain. And that would be the advantage of in this kind of architecture, right? So I was just curious how much thought you guys are putting into that and, and where you maybe see some pain points. And I'm not saying I, that there's a, there's not a 100% pure solution out there yet. So I'm not being critical. I'm just curious to understand how you, this is really amazing, by the way. I think you guys have done a great, this is really, really interesting. Um, but I'm curious to see how you're tackling those questions. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, uh, really good question, uh, Peter, there as well. Uh, the, the way we are envisioning this is, yes, that data is being captured here on the database, but at the same time, the data that we are talking to right on the chain, right? So there are two sources to look at. One is through the chain. Anything that we are pulling for the public, I think, um, you know, Justin will show you that. All these transactions will be pulled through and there will be a button to validate on the chain as well that, okay, you know what, this is what your app says, but is this, is, out of this data, the, the the metadata that we defined, which is critical, that can should not be tampered, is written on the chain. Is that matching up, uh, you know, for you? So, Justin, can you go back to the homepage and can you pull out that QR code? Yeah. Make a lot of sense for folks to take a look at now. Yeah. Um, open up. <laughs> so, so, so um, assume, Peter, all these transactions have happened, right? And you want to be able to see where you know, uh, you know, uh, so the data on the top uh, screen is is all pulled from the app as in the central database. But at the bottom, you see verify on blockchain. When I click on this, it will pull the data from blockchain and show you that transaction. And you can match up the, the, the metadata here that we have submitted is exactly the same as what is in the app. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great job. That's I haven't seen that very much yet. Nice work. What, one thing that I, I do also want to point out is that traceability apps normally work through something called a consortia because essentially it's a vertical implementation uh, or it, it's a technological implementation of a vertical supply chain. So in, in that instance, though, members of the vertical supply chain are sometimes coming from outside as opposed to one company where everybody belongs to the same company. So this is... The, the real challenge when designing a traceability system is you really have to interview all the component players and make a specification that addresses their security issues. Some of them don't want to necessarily reveal the pricing. Maybe some of them will have security vis-a-vis -vis where all their product has come from. Those are the sorts of things that actually come through the interview process with the client. But the beauty of this is, and I know because in uh, past experiences I've worked where people have tried to build it exclusively uh, on blockchain is it makes it easy to make those changes vis-a-vis -vis security, vis-a-vis -vis who the supply chain participants are so they can uh, determine who gets access to what information. You can update and make those changes relatively easy. For our demo, we kept it as simple as possible, ex uh, exposed as much as possible as much of the metadata as possible to the supply chain, just to prove the point that we are reading and writing to the testnet. And uh, 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 Justin, can you scroll up and yep. just show the QR code? And this is this is a this is deployed on our you know one of our servers. Um, uh, Justin, can you pull up the the QR code? Yeah. Yep. So um, you know if if you scan this QR code right now on your phone you will be able to go check these 
the transactions that we are showing uh, out here, um, you can go, uh, you know, take a look at those. Uh, you can pull the whole chain, exactly what Justin is showing, and you can see those verify on blockchain buttons and you can validate the data there. That's awesome, guys. That's I just did it. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I hope I, everybody I, actually I, I, does that because it is pretty cool. Right? Yeah, it is very cool. I see I'm doing it right now. Um, so I, I think the problem that you're describing about disclosing like certain partners in the chain, disclosing different kinds of information, I think those kinds of things are being solved with like decentralized identifier and wallets, right? And then like disclosing yeah. certain parts of your, so uh, are you, so we, we're, for some of the work we're doing, we're looking at some integrations uh, for that. Are you guys looking at a DID integration somewhere along the line? Yeah, that's the next step, uh, Peter. I mean, there is there is just a lot going on right now. Oh, I understand. I understand. Yes. Having all, bringing all those things in, in one shot is going to be confusing for everyone as well. So we thought, let's take it in layers. Let's show how we can build the app and then we can add the sophistication from security, from identity, so on and so forth. So it's kind of, you know, peeling the onion, if you will. Yeah, no, I've, I get it. I just, I just try to, I'm just trying to catch up to where you guys are. So yeah, um, just, this is really amazing work. Just so you know, Peter, uh, I think it was last week, my dates are off. We had a discussion with uh, Roberto from uh, Gimbal Labs, who is working on the Game Changer wallet. And I think probably later this week or next week, we'll be speaking with the folks from IMX. And I've been working with the folks at IMX out of uh, Dusseldorf. So th th this just, is like- we just, got off, we just got off a call with them and before this meeting. All right. So I'm an advisor <laughs> to them yeah. and helping. Okay. So yeah. Th they, use like that, they use the line API as well. Yeah. So yeah, there are a lot of moving parts, but we're, we're trying to stay, we're, we're in the game. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like we're in the same playground. So that's amazing. Good work, guys. Any other questions? Uh, I think, uh, Justin, if you want to go back to the app, but I hope uh, this gave an idea about, you know, we did not touch code in anywhere uh, right now as we walk through the, the building of the app, in, you know, in creating an account, moving, you know, transactions, writing metadata to the chain. Um, there was no code utilized. Uh, you know, while doing that. Yes, we have to sophisticate wherein I, I, you know, when we get a response URL from the, you know, the transaction, I want to be able to put that on the front end by drag and drop feature. Everything you see in Joget is, is drag and drop. It's not that you don't have to write code, you only write code when you really need it. For example, if, if uh, in, in this case, there, there is a little bit of code written to, you know, show uh, the QR code on the front end screen. Uh, generation of the QR code and all again, those are all drag, drag and drop features, you know, built in Joget uh, as well. Any 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 questions? Uh, again, we have a video. Uh, Justin, can you go back to our blog uh, site just to yep. uh, and also go to the GitHub uh, for the Cardano uh, blockchain pack. I also yep. think we okay. have a question from T Tefera. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry if this has been answered. I was a little bit away, but I just want to ask about the cost of using this mm -hmm. uh, platform. I'm sorry, what was the question? What is what the is cost? You wanted to ask about the cost. The cost of using, things. yeah, for, 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 exa for example, for an individual farmer, how, how much would it cost, for example? This is, the platform is like $120 per user uh, for the whole year. And that's at the highest level. Now, when we're talking about the traceability app, of course, that is a different scenario because um, obviously a farmer is not going to be paying, uh, a cocoa farmer in Ghana is not going to be paying $120 a year. But certainly in the case of a Cardano developer, your maximum license is uh, 120 US dollars a year. There are certain exceptions, like for instance, right now we're in discussions with a, a, a government and the government does, would not necessarily want their data residing in the cloud. So in this instance, there is specific uh, pricing and implementations that would allow the government to host the entire Jogit implementation all the software uh, themselves in their country on their servers. And that has different bespoke pricing that is managed by mm -hmm. the Jogit team. I, I do want to highlight 
that uh, there is no license if you are you know pulling the data you know, for example the qr code scanning i mean everyone uh, tried to scan it there was no license utilized for that the only license utilizes the the parties that are writing to the chain so uh, yeah, and uh, we also have unlimited user licensing um, you don't need to uh, you know the the only users we charge is first 300 users everything else is uh, unlimited so so that's uh, there are various options for licensing i mean there are sometimes it's app based depending upon what you are trying to do uh, the licensing that i'm number i'm giving is unlimited apps and limited users um, you know or oh, sorry with 120 dollars per user unlimited apps unlimited processes so there is no restriction there uh, peter you have a question yeah so i guess maybe i want to clarify then so uh, the i so Jogit is open source, is is that right, or is it? That is correct. So, so I, there, um, let me let me quickly highlight Jogit. So there's like a community, uh, like a community edition. I could I could download yes. the full stack and run my own server. And so that what you're correct. describing are fees for using the hosted Jogit service, like the supported enterprise service that Jogit provides. To like when you say the uh, like, there's different fees involved, that kind of thing. But it sounds like if I, as a developer, wanted to download, I could download a, a community edition of the Jogit stack and run my own Jogit service if I wanted to. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. You can go to Jogit, download Jogit community edition. Uh, there are a bunch of additional features and a lot of plugins embedded in the enterprise edition. So all the, you know, if any organization has to use it, we recommend enterprise edition, but community edition is there to download and try and all. Um, no restriction there. Um, somebody, Percy Munira, asked the question, will there be an option to create an USSD, especially for the local farmers whose internet connectivity is limited but have access to a cell service? If, if uh, Percy, if you're able to speak, would you be able to elaborate on your question? I don't really understand that, or somebody else understands the question so we can try and answer it. Okay, well then we'll take this down and I guess uh, hopefully with mercy, we'll be able to study this and then get an answer uh, back to you if, if you can yeah. respond to Andrew, it now. Andrew, if, if I can uh, interject uh, for a moment. Uh, Justin, can you scroll down? Yep, yep uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, Peter, just to give you an idea, I mean, there is a blog step-by-step -step process. Anyone can go there, try it out. This one, this blog is around uh, using block frost, um, you know, uh, APIs. Uh, and there is a video, step-by-step -step video to, you know, try building an app. Uh, some of the features that you saw, like the generate app feature, those are not in community edition. There are limited set of controls in community edition. But yes, you can try completely. Um, you know, you can even download uh, and try enterprise edition and request a trial license through our site. Plenty of information. All the all the information is available on our, you know, if you go to our forum our community, I mean, there are plenty of. Uh, we have almost around twelve thousand community um, uh, users. Um, they are actively answering each other as well now. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, people sometimes forget is, if you've been a part of any of the pioneers programs, you realize that the challenges of developing for blockchain isn't necessarily just the coding. It's setting up the environment. Now, once you actually go to build out an application and deploy it to a client, setting up the environment becomes super difficult because each client will have specific backend requirements, specific infrastructure requirements, containers. So one of, of course, while the, the open source edition is there, how we make it easy is basically for the cost of a Dropbox account, which is I think $9.99 a month, or Spotify, which is $9.99 a month, you get the highest level Jogit developer edition deployed across the cloud where you don't have to worry about any of that. You can build the applications and essentially run a business off of that platform. So just to put it into perspective, we are talking about Spotify or Dropbox, then Jogit, which allows you to build your blockchain applications that many people can use and you have the added security of knowing the open source code is out there.
That's one thing. The second thing I want to add is they have a customer list. And I think, Ravish, you should mention perhaps some of the government yeah. and ministries involved, because this is yeah, why yeah, we applied under nation building. I appreciate that. Um, so, um, guys, I mean, uh, Jogit is not new. We have been around for a number of years. Uh, we are uh, we are in, in U.S. Department of Defense, Canadian government. We have, um, you know, large companies like Daimler and, uh, you know, Airbus and um, all sorts of customers um, as our, uh, you know, um, as our customers. Uh, let me see if I can pull a quick uh, uh, information, piece of information out. Um, the, what, what uh, fascinated us is, uh, you know, by looking at these plugins, we can accelerate. And there will be a time, point in time, when we are talking about cross-chain transactions also. And, you know, the beauty here is, you know, we have a Hyperledger Fabric plugin. We have, uh, you know, a Ripple plugin. I mean, we, we are looking at to see if we can help, uh, you know, the overall uh, community, not just from one, but from various perspective. And... Um, if I can, uh, I can, you know, share the screen uh, for a moment. Um, yep. I think I will sharing. need access, um, please. Okay, there you go. Yep. Okay. Um, bear with me for a moment. Any any questions I can answer while I'm pulling this out? Well, Percy asked a question about the feature phone menus, and I I think. Uh, it's safe to say we'd have to get back to you about that. I don't know if you have a plugin that enables, you know, those feature phones that they have cell service, but they don't have visual menuing systems. Uh, my understanding, and they're quite common, uh, for instance, in Ghana. Um, I think we'd probably have to get back to you on that one. Uh, cool. So I hope you guys can see my screen. Um, we have pretty um, uh, Ravi, just uh, quickly, uh, I think Nana Safo has a question. Yes, yes. Hi, Nana. Um, hi, not necessarily a question, just wanted to um, um, elaborate what uh, you wanted to ask. Uh, it was just um, like, for, so, so there, there are some, you know, <clears throat> some places, there are some places in the world that, um, for instance, uh, you know, people have phones, but the phones are not smartphones. So they don't have any access to the internet. But instead, they can dial some codes on their phone, like for instance, star um, one two four hash, basically to check their credit balance. So he was asking if, uh, you know, in any case, uh, there's, there's any option that, you know, people without smartphones, especially farmers, because most of them, you know, for instance, in Ghana here, most of them that don't really use smartphones and stuff. They are all about this, um, archaic phones and stuff. So if you, you know, you could build a platform for these people, and then they can get access to. You know, whatever it is that they get used to offer, I think uh, that is what he's asking if it's possible. Understood. Um, we do have a SMS interface. I mean, you can, uh, you know, from Joget standpoint, but we it uh, we will have to look into the exact use case. Can we build something that can be driven by just SMS? You know, interacting with Joget, uh, that is feasible. Um, you know, we we have the SMS. You can you can. So we have an SMS plugin. You can plug in any API, SMS API, and then enable, you know, it for interaction. Uh, but that's a good point. That's something that we should look at. Um, so uh, just going, getting back to, you know, we have some industry recognition from Forrester. We have, you know, a bunch of reviews from our customers on Gartner Insights, um, so on and so forth. And you know, as I said, we have pretty good customers across the globe. We have Saudi government, we have French government as a customer, we have Italian government as a customer. Um, uh, and when it comes to, you know, commercial, we have, you know, Daimler, um, we have Toyota, we have BMW, we have, um, yeah, you can you can take a look at, uh, you know, all sorts of customers in, in healthcare, government, banking, finance, insurance, so on and so forth. Uh, and we have pretty good spread across, um, you know, the globe uh, as such. Good news is you can actually create uh, um, applications in various languages using Joget. I can run the same application in Spanish and English and, and French. Um, we can do that. Uh, being open source, um, if you, uh, let me show you if I can. Um,
um, I'm sorry, give me one second. Um, so being an open source, the community, it, uh, the, the, the lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, if you go to translate.jogate.org, um, you have the X7, which is the latest version. You can see, I mean, Arabic, Chinese, Taiwanese, you know, French, German, uh, Indonesian, Spanish, you know, and, and you know, these, these conversions are going on based on, you know, how the community is using, you know, Jogit as well. And this is the, the, the Jogit open source Cardano blockchain pack. I mean, it is, it's out there. Anyone can download, you know, and, and extend that. That's our, our vision that we will be able to expose this as a, you know, open source component that, that various community, uh, um, you know, members can come and make changes, so on and so forth. Yep, I think that's, uh, those are some pretty good points that are raised. Any other questions? Um, I hope we were able to give an idea of what it means when we, talk, we are talking about, you know, no code, low code and, and accelerating the adoption by uh, even end users who may not know coding, but are more interested in building the app on chain and trying it out. I've got a question for you, Ravish. Um, you mentioned quite a good client list there. What sort of scale of apps are people are building? Are they building sort of internal staff stuff or is it sort of global facing web front end stuff? What I mean by that is sort of metrics like number of users and number of screens. Oh, that you're yeah, using. Yeah, yeah. So we have all sorts of, um, you know, size of applications, if you will. Yeah. Um, there are companies that are running almost around 200 apps on, on Yogit servers with thousands of users. I have US Department of Defense. They are... Mm -hmm. You know, they have started scaling up up to 30,000 users and their, their goal is to go up to a million users. Right. Um, Joget is enabled, you can run it on containers, you can auto scale. So there is no, you know, um, restriction there as such. Yeah. Um, and you can use Oracle, Microsoft SQL for the, the, the databases pieces. It's not restrictive, um, you know, completely open. Mm -hmm. you, you know, one of the things that I, I find interesting there has been some talk about, well, if Jogit is a company that is able to provide large solutions to these large enterprises, uh, perhaps that is controversial when discussing how this could impact the Cardano community. But I look at it from an entirely different way. That is precisely the objective that we're seeking. From my point of view, no large financial institution, engineering company, or manufacturing company will necessarily want to invest a sizable amount of money in something that is done exclusively by a startup. And I know this because I've been at both ends of the spectrum. I have started software companies. And many of the people here who have been with new products know how difficult it is sometimes to validate your entirely new product. So now we're in a situation where we get to piggyback the history and bona fides of one technological platform with the new integration of Cardano to truly accelerate enterprise adoption. So you can go in focusing on solving business problems with the understanding that your technology will work by integrating Jogit with your Cardano application. And I view that as a strength. Yeah. And Andrew, I just also want to highlight, uh, we need to also watch the industry, what is happening in the industry. I mean, these are some, th this is 2020 prediction and 2021 pr prediction is even, you know, better. What Gartner and some of these foresters uh, of the world are talking to enterprises is, you need to move to low code application development or no code application development, or it will be difficult to meet the developer needs, uh, let alone you know, getting the work done, right? And what their prediction is by 2025, 70% of the new applications are going to be developed in no-code, low-code platforms uh, like Joget. So let's, you know, from community perspective, if we want to onboard and, and give this power in hands of so-called citizen developers who may not know coding, but they are knowledgeable about the business, about the, the, the and ready for innovation, we need to give these this power to them to be able to showcase that 
what their idea is on blockchain. That's exactly what we are trying to enable. And when we enable that, it becomes easier for, you know, a, a business decision standpoint. I can see something working very quickly. What will it mean to us? And as we sophisticate these plugins, uh, you know, the, a lot more functionality will be becoming drag and drop, which means more acceleration from, you know, uh, uh, adoption standpoint. And second is also more acceleration of adoption of new features into my existing app that I have built. If we don't, if we don't ease out both the things because, you know, this is ever changing game, you know, new functionality is being developed every single day. How do I bring that into mainstream? Uh, other than writing and reading from the chain. That is also to be facilitated and made easy. This is exactly what our goal is with this project. And uh, if I might add, um, one of the things that people always neglect whenever they're pricing out a software project is not so much the cost of initial implementation, but it's the cost of ongoing maintenance. And right now I'm in a situation speaking with a government client where they're actually moving away from one solution and contemplating moving over to this solution. And this isn't actually a blockchain implementation, but the reason why is because they would like to have more control over their ability to make changes to at least basic user interface elements of their application. I mean, from web design to enterprise application development, clients like to be able to have certain assurances that there's going to be malleability, scalability, and flexibility in the future maintenance of their application. Mm -hmm. So th this has been a key element in my encouragement of Jogit to work with Cardano. Haskell is an obscure language. I code in Python, C, and C Sharp. Haskell's different. It's a functional language and a very challenging one. And to ask a business to focus their development dollars on a niche language, you're asking them to basically focus future cash flows and associate it with that niche technology. Whereas if we make it easy for them, then it's easy for them to adopt Cardano, which I think ultimately all of us are interested in. I think also I want to mention, this is another important point. These applications will not exist in a silo. Right, so what will happen is moment uh, any enterprise creates an application, its first need is going to be integration with other things as well. In Joget, we have something called an API, uh, you know, builder also. You can drag and drop, expose anything that you are creating in Joget as an API in minutes. So, um, you know, you 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 just have to pick that. For example, you know, uh, Justin, uh, if you can share your screen, you created a, a you know a form wherein you are created the users. Let's say I want to expose that as an API uh, externally. Um, can you quickly just in a minute show that, create an API and expose yep. what you just created as data as an API? Yep, sure. This would be very quick. <laughs> All right, so coming back, I'm just gonna show you how we can expose uh, data from Joget to your external applications. So uh, very quickly, I'm gonna log in back as the admin user. So just now we have our Cardano traceability app. And let's say I want to expose the batch data. How, how am I going to do that quickly? So on the left side here, I have something called the add-on builders. And I can just click create new API key. So in this case, I'll just call this test, click save. And we will be brought to something called the API builder. So we'll just wait a few seconds. And there we go. Right. So over here in the API builder, it's the same concept again. It's just drag and drop. So for example, let's say we want to retrieve the batch uh, that the processor has uh, performed. We can, for example, we drag in a list and we just need to select uh, perhaps a batch list and we need to enable this API function and just click save, just like that. And once you do this, it's really easy to even try it out, right? So let's say you need even more sophisticated, for, uh, sophisticated functions to automate process starting automate uh, process completion from APIs. You can also do that. So for example, if I want to expose the uh, generate account process, I can just select it and I can say, all right, I want to uh, start it by the current username. I want to start it uh, like this. I want to be able to abort it and so on and so forth. So once I do this, I can just click on OS3 document preview 
And all of this is going to be uh, compiled together into a Swagger API. So over here, for example, we can quickly try them out. Let's say I click on retrieve list batch. So click on try it out. I'll remove all these unnecessary filters for now and click on execute. So just like that, I can retrieve all the data in JSON notation, and then it's up to your third uh, party or external uh, apps to consume the APIs. So I hope this is uh, exactly what you're looking for. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Yeah.